Welcome to World Energy Television. I'm Richard Loomis, CEO of World Energy. And today we're speaking with Curtis Burton, CEO of Buccaneer Energy. Curtis, let's go back to the beginning. Buccaneer started in 2007. What was your drive or what was your overriding philosophy at the time? We thought we had a, uh, an excellent niche for a financial uh, opportunity in Australia, coupled with some uh, good opportunistic types of uh, developments here in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we put those two things together and started Buccaneer. You mentioned opportunistic. What is the overall philosophy behind Buccaneer Energy? Well, in the initial offering, we had a number of people that said, well, you guys aren't really all that focused, are you? Because you, you're doing offshore and you're doing onshore. And we said, well, again, the whole idea behind being a buccaneer is you're opportunistic. You take the best thing that you can get your hands on. And so that's what we did. We were taking advantage of an opportunity in Pompano in a, a field that had new information on it to go in and redevelop it and that's worked very well for us. That's still making six million cubic feet a day and uh, has been a real success story for us. Now you've got both onshore and offshore properties. Those are very different environments. What are some of the differences between operating onshore and operating offshore? Well, uh, there are a number of obvious things besides just the water. One is that in an offshore environment, you really generally have only federal and state regulatory issues to deal with. You're out there pretty much by yourself, and uh, you have parameters that you have to operate under, but uh, the considerations you have are largely to meeting regulatory requirements and, and doing what you need to do. In contrast to that, working on land, one of the reasons we actually favored offshore as a startup deal was that working on land has a whole other realm of things that have to be taken into account. One of them is the landowner. Uh, the, the story, as is with Lee, gets infinitely more challenging if you're dealing with a landowner who is also not a mineral rights owner, which is very prevalent in Texas. You can own the land and not own the mineral rights. So you have to be very considerate of those guys and you have to really work with them in ways that uh, don't impact you offshore. But what about operating in, say, Lee County? Well, Lee County has had a number of things that have gone on. The owner there runs a children's home uh, and we have tried to be very respectful of his access to his own property. He's not a mineral rights owner, so uh, we pay him for access to the land and as a good business idea, we, we try to work with his constraints. So that's slowed us down a bit. We've also had, for the first time in 50 years, all 50 states of America that have had snowfall at the same time. Ah, global warming. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, it hasn't felt very much like global warming where we've been sitting. We've had our road washed out twice and we've had uh, numerous repairs that have been necessitated by a very unusual weather, weather pattern. And so that has slowed us down. Uh, the access to the site has had an impact and then the, the well itself has been somewhat of an enigma on occasion, but we're coming to the end of that. It's being placed on production as we speak, and we're looking forward to good things out of Lee. And you're moving on to well number two, right? We are moving on to well number two. We have a 2,500-acre position there. We are very positive about what we've seen. The in-place oil on well number one has been placed by third party at 17.5 million barrels. You don't recover all of that. You recover only a small fraction of that, but that's a very encouraging number. So we see potentially as much as a 30 well program depending on how the wells go as we move along. But yes, we're starting well number two within the next few days. And now you have Alaska. Alaska is going to be a big focus. Stellar is not the last acquisition you'll hear about from us. We're, we're looking at a number of things we told shareholders at the shareholders meeting in November there were going to be a number of opportunities that were going to present themselves in 2010 and that is exactly what's happening and so we are working that very hard. Well we've got a lot of activity now in 2010. 
But it hasn't always been smooth sailing for Buccaneer, has it? Uh, I would say, as with many people in the industry, 2009 was a very challenging year for us. Uh, many of the people that we consulted with, worked with, talked about doing things with uh, in 2009 are simply not in business anymore. Uh, it was such a harsh environment. Uh, summer of 2009, in our case, because of uh, financial constraints and other things that have gone on, our shareholders know we got down to a very low value, uh, but through some outstanding efforts on the part of uh, Dean Gallagher and uh, McCory and the financial network that we've had to work with, we are uh, in a good, sound financial shape today. Uh, we made a, a lot of sacrifices on a personal level to make that happen last year. The management team gave up their contracts, they gave up vested shares of stock, they gave up vested options, they gave up uh, in some cases 50% of their pay, in other cases 57% of their pay. The management team did a lot to help the company get through what was a very bad period last year and so we're, we're looking forward to some good news in, in 2010. We're talking with Curtis Burton, and we'll be right back with more details.